want to do a check on sound. And so if I wander, can, can people hear me if I wander? Yes, no? Not well. Not well, okay, all right. And I know it's good video, so I will stay tethered. I like to wander, but I'll, I'll stay tethered. Tonight, the goal is to think with all of you about this phenomenon of mobile health and to really push our minds a little bit into what the value of it is, what it really means. I do believe it's transformational, turn, turn and I don't more. say yeah, those kinds yeah. of words lightly, but I believe mobile yeah, health is a game changer, and I also oh, believe okay. we haven't really seen its potential at all yet. And I came up with this meme, making health addictive, to, to really kind of try to push that idea. And, and I'll explain what I mean about that presently. But it really starts out with this phenomenon, and, and I'm looking to see. I don't see any <laughs> smartphone checkers in the audience. If you're the kind of person who can't okay. put your phone down for 20 minutes, listen up, because this is really a good talk for you. <laughs> Most people are checking them about 150 times a day, it turns out, which is, is quite remarkable when you think about it. I, I check mine all the time. You have this habit you develop that when you have a free minute, you pull out your phone, right? You just Because why? I'm not sure why, but it's some, there's something new waiting for you there. There's some alluring thing. So we check them all the time, and uh, my laptop's about to fall. Contrast that with this story that I'm about to tell you, which is a story from our center, uh, the Center for Connected Health downtown here at Partners Healthcare, uh, which many of you know is the de delivery system in town anchored by Harvard's two largest teaching hospitals, the Brigham and Women's and the Mass General. And we have the privilege at our center of pushing the envelope on this concept of connected health, bringing care to, into the lives of patients and really pushing the envelope on this notion that maybe you don't always have to visit a provider in a physical space to get something done. Well, this is a story from a program we've run for several years called Blood Pressure Connect. And it gives you a sense of a number of themes about how we design programs. One aspect is a feedback loop. In this case, it's a blood pressure reading that the patient takes themselves. And then we have, of course, providers, usually nurses or pharmacists, looking at a dashboard of those readings and reaching out into patients' lives to counsel them if their numbers aren't right. So the patient gets the feedback of their numbers, and they also know that if the numbers aren't quite right, they'll hear from a healthcare provider. And this turns out to be a really powerful set of designs around getting people engaged around their health. So that's really just background for what I want to share about this particular story. <coughs> what you see here pictured are two different hub technologies that we use. So the idea is if I'm going to get that blood pressure reading into the cloud so I can do something interesting with it, I've got to get it out of the device. The devices are usually Bluetooth enabled these days. And that requires that we use a, a hub of one sort or another. And there are two pictures here. The difference between these two for the purposes of the discussion is that the one on the uh, left, sorry, the one on the yeah left, you have to push a button to upload your blood pressure. Push one button. And the one on the right, you don't. So at one point in our evolution, we, we, only need, we only actually use the technology like the one on the right now. But at one point in our evolution, we had both of these out in the field. So we did a little study. And we looked at a cohort of patients, and the only difference was that they had to push a button or not to upload their blood pressure reading. The people that had to push a button uploaded much less frequently, <laughs> and their outcomes were not as good. So passive data upload made a big difference. And again, I go back to this idea that you're checking your phone 150 times a day, but if I ask you, and these are programs where the doctor gives the patient the technology in their office and says, this would be a good idea for you. And we can't get people to push a button once for a, a concept that their doctor said was a good idea for them. So this whole got me thinking, this idea that Mobile health devices seem to be so addictive, but I can't get people to push one button to improve their health. 
what does that say about the way we're approaching messaging about health? <clears throat> and could we change that, again, in this context of mobile devices? Well, mobility and health, I believe, really is a game changer, really is transformational for several reasons. The first is this idea of always on and always connected. Again, you've all experienced this by now many, many times, whether it be the Google Maps app that got me here this evening and 45 minutes of traffic or any number of other applications. These things are powerful devices. They're in the palm of your hand. That gives me the opportunity to message you in the moment. And from a health perspective, we've never had that opportunity in history to be able to reach into your life in the moment, get in your path, and send you a message that's relevant to your health. Now I have to get you to receive that message, process it, and do something about it. That, that may be the hard part, but just the idea that I can reach into your life and message you in the moment <coughs> is really powerful and we've never had that opportunity to date. We always had to have you get motivated enough to drive in or walk in and see the doctor to get messaged about your health. No more. And the other flip side of it is you can capture a lot of data about your health. The device has sensors in it, has an accelerometer, has uh, a GPS tracker. It can track all kinds of interesting things about your health. And of course, it can take pictures of things, whether it be a test that you might do that has a readout. You can take a picture. And these days, there are a number of folks that are processing those images uh, with image analysis technology, not with people. So there's interesting ways of doing that. And then the Bluetooth in your phone will hook to any number of sensors. That hub device that I showed you a minute ago is going away, and your phone is going to replace it uh, as the main hub device for uploading your physiologic information. So again, really powerful that we can both message you in the moment, that we can collect data about your health in a way that we never could before. And of course, we can use it as a display device as well. So, these are all things that I'm sure all of you have heard about and thought about. That's nothing perhaps new here under the sun. This is to me striking that these things are addictive. And I have, as I said, really thought a lot about this. I'm still thinking about it, so very much looking forward to the dialogue that follows this discussion to get your feedback on the way I'm thinking about it because I do think we very much not even scratch the surface of leveraging this opportunity that people have to check these things constantly. <coughs> so you've all been in situations like this. I don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> right. This is again common and, and I really thank you all. Nope, so far I don't see any phone checkers. Usually there's a few in the audience. And even though I admonish them, they're back to checking their phone. And then things like this happen, right? Tourist walks off Australian Pier while uh, checking Facebook. <laughs> Even better is the quote, right? Melbourne police warn people to pay attention when using social media around water. I guess the other way is you check your phone, you don't need to pay attention, just social media. I'm not sure. But this kind of stuff happens, and you've all seen videos by now on YouTube of people tripping while checking their phone. So I've made the point that these things are really addictive. It's really interesting. Again, it's maybe the first time in history we've had something that everyone can relate to now. 75, 85% of the population in this country, and you've heard it, more, more phones and toothbrushes. That's a really unifying experience that we can all relate to, and it is addictive. So how do we take that addictive experience of having to check your phone? Sorry, yes? Is there an ICD-10 code for that? <laughs> for walking off the pier, I don't know. And you know what, I hope I never learned. Smartphone addiction. Well, there, there may not be, but I suggest we don't invent one. <laughs> we'll move on from, from ICD-10 anyway. So how, how do we take advantage of this idea? And I've thought about it in terms of three strategies and three tactics. And this, again, is the part where I'm looking for feedback because I don't have it all figured out. Uh, but these seem compelling to me, and I want to share them uh, with you now. So the three strategies are Make it about life, make it personal, and reinforce social connections. Let's go through them each. Make it about life is just the idea that, I don't know how many of you have ever said, 
you're worried about your doctor yelling to you. Anyone say that? I know. I don't know. I, are the clinicians in the audience? I'm a clinician. I can promise you I've never yelled at a patient. Can you move the microphone closer? They're asking in the back there. Sure. Hard time. That's, sorry. I've never yelled at a patient in 30 years of practicing medicine. I don't know where this idea of yelling at your doctor comes from. But we have this sort of psychology that we tell you things like, if you don't lose 20 pounds, you're going to have a stroke. Or you better get your blood pressure in shape or you're going to get a heart attack. Nobody wants to hear that, right? You go out and immediately forget it, deny it, go have a beer, what have you. How about if we said, what are your goals in life? Because you actually have health goals, but you might say, well, I really want to lose five pounds to fit into an outfit to wear to my daughter's wedding. I really want to be able to have more energy to, to play with my grandchildren. <clears throat> That's what Make It About Life is, and we can do a lot better at that, and we need to start doing that as clinicians. So Make It About Life is strategy number one. Now, the way this works is I'm going to share for most of these some examples from work we're doing at our center to try to give you a sense of how this could fit into a healthcare messaging uh, platform. And the example I have for you on this one is from a program we've created for text messaging for uh, pregnancy. <coughs> and if you think about it, if I know your due date, I actually can now predict a lot of things about you for the next eight or nine months and a couple of months postpartum. <coughs> so we feed that into a uh, application that generates messages in a timed way. And we can generate messages that are timely during your pregnancy. Just add a little, this is from your OB team to the front end, and it feels personalized. And we've had a lot of great success uh, with this. These are some of the stats. 74% of these <laughs> women say it helped them learn to take better care of their, uh, themselves and their babies. Lots and lots of good feedback, and it's a real loyalty builder, too. Because we're just taking a simple technology of a text messaging campaign, personalizing it a little bit, and making it about life. Here's another interesting one that I saw in the news the other day. This one is uh, from the American Heart Association. People know cardiac risk factors, like a 3.5 or 5, whatever the number is. I'm a doctor. It doesn't mean anything to me, and I'm a doctor. But you tell me that I'm 57. Tell me that my heart age is 65, and I'm going to pay attention. And that's what this little tidbit is about, that if we just turn things around a little bit, and say things like, your heart age is X, that's much more engaging than saying your cardiac risk ratio is 4.3. So we're catching on to this idea of make it about life. That's strategy number one. Strategy number two is make it personal. This is one of my favorites because it turns out that the advertising industry is way ahead of us on this. You all know by now that if you and I sat this laptop and your laptop side by side and went on to a web browser, Chrome or Foxfire, any one of them, we'd see a completely different experience because your digital breadcrumbs are being processed in the background and my digital breadcrumbs are being processed in the background and they're being fed back to us as little tantalizing messages to uh, buy something or push the button here and get brought to this website. This is powerful stuff. The advertising industry has figured out how to do it really well, and it's personalized. <clears throat> I think we can do this with healthcare with some caveats. It's harder to get you to do something healthy than to make an impulse purchase, but some of the same, I believe, ideas will hold true, that we can collect information about you, analyze it, and feed it back to you in a personalized way. Here's an example of a trial we just finished at our center to try to do just that with type 2 diabetes and walking behavior. And we did three things here. So I always tell people, Google, if Google were here, they would kind of laugh at this, say it's very Mickey Mouse, the way they collect data and process it. But this is healthcare, and we're just getting on board. We're usually 15 to 20 years behind other companies. So we're there. <laughs> three different data points. The first one is just five questions that we ask every entrant into the program about their motivation to be more active. This is based on, for those of you who are familiar, the trans-theoretical model of behavior change, which puts you through stages as you get more and more interested in more and more uh, 
competent at achieving a certain behavior, in this case walking. So we can ask five questions. It turns out that three of them are related to your actual physical activity, and we're going to track that as well. So uh, we, it turns out that during the course of the intervention, if we just send out a text message every couple weeks with one of those two other questions, we can calibrate this motivational val uh, value point in a relatively dynamic way throughout. So that's point one. Point two is a smart pedometer. Tom Blackadar is here. We use the device that his company makes called the uh, Pebble, but we could also use a Fitbit. It, it, any smart tracker will do, and they're all easy to integrate now, and their APIs are all available. But the idea is that we give you a, a device that passively collect your activity, and we just upload that. You don't have to do anything but be yourself, and we know how active you are. So automatically, we now we're, we're, we're sort of mapping that against how active you said you wanted to be and how motivated you said you want to be. And then variable three is just some location-based data so that we don't, say, message someone in Mattapan about the Whole Foods that isn't there and things like that. Uh, so three kinds of data points, and we mash them up in this analytic engine and generate. Now, this is the important part. Twice a day, machine-generated, customized motivational messages for these participants. And generally speaking, they're walking better now. We're analyzing the data right now. We finished the study. We're looking carefully at it. I don't have all the p-values and such yet. We saw a lot of people go through those stages of pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, etc. And their step counts go up month after month. So we're very excited about this. We think we obviously there's many more data points we can pull in and there's many more sophisticated kind of sensors we can add, but the idea that we're pulling in data and personalizing it to generate personalized messages to improve your health. So make it personal is strategy number two. <coughs> this may be, may be the most important of the strategies, and the, maybe the most important overriding principle in this whole thing. Some of you, perhaps many of you, have read Nicholas Christakis and Jane Fowler's book, Connected, a very powerful treatise on the power of social networks, which predated Facebook, Friendster, and all of them, and just really showed that you really are affected by the people around you, even if they move away. Fascinating, well worth a read, but social is powerful. And those of you who spend a lot of time on Facebook know that you present yourself a certain way on Facebook. That's because it's, you, you care what people think about you. This is a fundamental human, both need for connectivity and we care what those people are thinking about us. We're going to come back to that part in a minute. So we decided to ask the question if, for kids with asthma, if joining a private Facebook group was in and of itself therapeutic just being in a group about your asthma. And it turns out that it is. There's something called the asthma control test, which these kids are supposed to take that has uh, well been associated with compliance and adherence and, and outcomes, and teenagers, right? So that the, the adherence to this thing in the baseline is about 17%. Just by putting these kids in a, fo a Facebook group and leaving them to themselves, we're getting 40, 50, 60 percent adherence to this instrument. So interesting that just being in a social network around your condition can be therapeutic in and of itself. Reinforce social connections. Now strategies, uh, I bet there's a few strategy people in the audience, but really we need tactics as well. So I'm going to offer three tactics. You, you'll see they relate back to these strategies. This is very dynamic. And as I said, I'm probably missing one or two here. Very much looking forward to your thoughts on this. But tactics are subliminal messaging, uh, which I'll go through now. Subliminal messaging is the first one. And I don't mean, I want to really be careful about this. So those of you who are my age remember those films and commercials where you know, they would show things in the background. Allegedly you couldn't see it, but it would... This isn't what I'm talking about. But this is interesting. People have recognized this, the American Legacy Foundation and the Truth Campaign. I got a phone checker over here. Um, <laughs> it, 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 
if uh, you don't, you probably don't have teenagers. But if you do have teenagers, you probably have at least heard of it. This is fascinating marketing directed at teenagers with the goal of educating them to not smoke, but never, never lecturing to them that smoking's bad for you. That's the whole thing behind it. So this is one example. If you go, it's worth, it's actually entertaining and really opens your mind to go to the either Truth Campaign or American Legacy Foundation and just look at what they've done. Here's an example. This one is, takes advantage of the fact that cigarette smoke has both methane in it, which is in feces, and urea in it, which is in urine. And they created a Twitter campaign to ask the teenagers, which is more gross to you, poop or pee? <laughs> and there's this whole thing about hashtags and you know the usual kind of viral spread. But really taking advantage of this and never, never saying you shouldn't smoke, but just keep saying, well, they're both in cigarette smoke and they're both kind of gross, so what conclusion do you come to? That's what I mean by subliminal messaging. And the way I relate it back to the mobile phone is, if I could, every time you pick that thing up and look at it, if I could slip in a healthcare message, sooner or later that will get to you, whether you read it or not. So here's an example from our center of a program we did. Now, even though I've got a picture of an iPhone here, this was pre-smartphone, back 2005 or so. I'm a dermatologist, so a lot of my ideas come from dermatology. And one of the dermatology residents came to me and said, I really think we could promote sunscreen adherence by sending out a daily text message. So we said, all right, well, why not? Let's try it. So we designed a trial. We had a device that would measure whether people actually took sunscreen out of the tube or not. And we sent half of the people a daily text message, and half we didn't do anything. We just gave them the tube that had the funny thing on it, and told them to wear their sunscreen, and sent them on their merry way. What's interesting about this, though, is, and I have to be honest with you, it was, kind of, it was kind of an afterthought, but when we were designing these messages, we put in, remember, this is pre-smartphone apps, we put in the daily weather report in the front end of the text. And then at the back end was, don't forget to wear your sunscreen. And you can see the results on the graph, right? The top line is adherence in the intervention group, 60 70%. And the bottom line is the control group, which as you might expect with no additional reminders, fades out pretty quickly. Quite dramatic. We said, gee, a daily text message. But when we asked the people, and this is the punchline, when we asked the people, what did you think of it? They said, we actually like the weather report. <laughs> we didn't really pay attention to the sunscreen message. And you know what, I don't care because they put their sunscreen on. And that's what I mean by subliminal messaging. We can do a better job of that. There have actually been other studies published since where they didn't, they just said to people, this was a use your medication text message. Guess what, people, they get sick of that. They stop opening the messages when you send them a message that says, use your medication. So you've got to, this relates back to make it about life, right? You've got to get in there and get into some kind of messaging that's relevant and is, is, is good for people, and then slip your health message in. Again, I think if you're checking your phone 150 times a day, we have a real opportunity to do that. Tactic number two is use unpredictable rewards. This is a great one, little Easter eggs. People who do software development know exactly what I mean by Easter eggs. But, and I don't have an example from our center on this one. I do have an example from the marketplace, the company Uber. Many of you are aware of this company. I'm sure you can use it to flag a fancy ride. It's a little bit of a taxi disruptor. It's all done on your phone. You see where the car is, how long it's gonna take to get to you, what the fee's gonna be. And then when you get in the car, you don't need to exchange a credit card or anything. It's all done back end. That's all interesting, and they've been in the news for a lot of controversial things about their pricing and so forth. But what I want to call your attention to here is the fact that for every now and then, those of you who have this know it, when you open the app, you get something completely unrelated to flagging a cab. It's a coupon to, say, get a bouquet of flowers at a discount or get a massage at some place. And the, that's not their core business. But they do it because people open the app more, because they're looking for those little unpredictable rewards. 
B.F. Skinner taught us this, right? Those of you who study con operant conditioning, when the rat and the pellets, remember that, and this, they, you know, if they, if they hear the sound after a while, they salivate even if the pellet doesn't come. That whole thing works a whole lot better if the pellet is variable than if it's constant. So variable rewards, very, very powerful. Using variable, unpredictable rewards. The last one is the Sentinel effect. So this maps back to social. This maps back to social. But in our case, we're going to use the example of a project that I talked about already, Blood Pressure Connect. And just re remind you again of that project or that program. It's now a program set to scale within our delivery system. For people that are having trouble controlling their blood pressure, they get a cuff, they get one of those hubs that I talked about. and they take their pressure, they can look at it on actually our patient gateway, they can look at it on the, uh, their phone, what have you, and uh, either a nurse or a pharmacist somewhere is watching those dashboards and every now and then placing a call, especially to the people whose blood pressures aren't in order, right? And we see data like this. So this is data from a clinical trial that we did, and not to over labor the science, belabor the science, but the uh, orange bars are the intervention group. It's uh, on the left a 10 point drop in systolic blood pressure. On the right a 5 point drop in diastolic. Both of those clinically significant, meaningful drops in blood pressure over time. And the intervention group in both cases had far more than the control group. So we have a phenomenon that works and we say, well, what, what about it works? Why, why does this work? And the patient said to us, because we know someone in our doctor's office is checking. We're uploading more, watching our lifestyle, watching our diet. We don't want to get yelled at, once again. <laughs> we don't want to get yelled at for using salt in our food or eating a pastrami sandwich. So we're really careful. And we want our numbers to look good for the doctor. That's the Sentinel effect. And it's really powerful. And it doesn't just work in healthcare. Some of you, if you're a local, remember a story that was in the Boston Globe, I want to say nine months ago, where they put a cardboard cutout of a policeman yeah. at the alewife tea stop near the bike racks and bike theft went down. This is a powerful basal brainstem psychology. Yeah. We can leverage it to improve health. So those are three strategies and three tactics for us to consider. Now, what might it look like? Because this is all very abstract, and you might be thinking by now, I wish I was checking my phone and listening to this guy. <laughs> but let me just bring it home in a couple of examples. As I often do, I'm taking examples from other industries that are interesting, and I think show how we might be able to use this approach to improve health. And as I said, to really leverage mobile health far more than we have to date. The first one is Facebook Home. Now, some of you may be familiar with this. Facebook brought it out for a time, and then they discontinued it. But it was a download for Android phones that basically took over the front end of your screen so that whenever you log on to your phone, you got your Facebook first. And then you could go to your email or your text or whatever it was that you really went on your phone for. Maybe a little bit invasive. But think about if you had something like this offered by, say, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Massachusetts or your health care provider if you're in a provider that's a accountable care organization. And they said, we'd like to have you download this app. Every time you pick up your phone, you're going to get some message from us. But if you do it, we'll give you a drop in your premium. People might do that. People might do that. And you'll see more, I'm sure you'll see more opportunities like that, especially with the exchanges and all this consumerization of healthcare, to trade things like an app for a premium. Uh, or the other one I like is, uh, people know Progressive Auto, you put a sensor on your car, and if you get drive safely, they'll give you safe driver discounts. Why not give people a, an activity tracker to where it gets 10,000 steps a day, we'll give you a safe person discount. I can see that happening, so I think there's some opportunities here. So f this idea of having something on your home screen that's health related, that you get essentially paid for using, that we can message you for, that's one way this could turn.
turn out. Here's another one. People know Google Field Trip. Anybody know this app? This is interesting, and, and if you live in Boston, it's really interesting because Google has made this app. It's, it's a fun thing. You download it. It runs in the background, but it's always using your GPS tracker to map your location to Google Maps in the background. And if you walk by, say, a building of interest like the Old North Church